There you are. Does that show up on YouTube or what? You just go um, on the church website, don't you? And yeah. Well, they have a link in the front street happenings. So you just yeah, right. hit the link and it goes right to us. Yeah, I think I think they're on YouTube. Mm. I think that's where it goes to. Yeah. So here we are. So now I've hit record. Be careful about what you say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, glad to see you all. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we seek your wisdom and your, uh, your guidance as we, as we uh, talk some more about Luke and uh, see what he has to say to us. Uh, your scripture is, is so wonderful. It, it teaches us not only about our salvation, but about what it means to live as disciples. So give us your Holy Spirit this morning that we might discern what it is that you need for us to know. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we left off last week uh, right before the, um, the passage on Jesus healing, and uh, that starts in verse 40. So we're going to start there today. <clears throat> Chapter 8, verse 40. Who would like to read the rest of chapter eight for us? You can do that. All right, sir. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house, for he had one only daughter about 12 years of age and she lay a dying but as he went the people thronged him and a woman having an issue of blood 12 years which had spent all her life living upon physicians neither could be healed of any came behind him and touched the border of his garment and immediately her issue of blood staunched and Jesus said who touched me when all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And when the women saw that she had not hid, she came trembling and was falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. And when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in safe save Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, weep not, she is not dead, but Salipa. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out, took her by the hand and called saying, maid arise. And her spirit came again and she rose straight away and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Again, don't tell anybody. That's right. <laughs> don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. All right. So we've got two people here who are basically at the intersection of predicament and faith. And uh, it was Jairus and the woman with the hemorrhage. Um, why do you think it's interesting that, uh, that Jairus comes up to Jesus. Who, who was Jairus? Who does it say he is? He was a priest, wasn't he? Or a high priest? <laughs> says he was a leader of the local synagogue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's likely that he was probably not a priest. Uh, he was, um, today we, we would probably call him an executive pastor. Yeah. 
Um, and some, some churches have executive pastors that take care of all the administration and uh, all the business stuff of the church. So, uh, you know, making sure that if, if the pastor's out, that somebody is there to fill the pulpit and all the lay people have stuff to do and basically organizes the life of the church. That's kind of what this guy was. He was pretty high up in the church and, or excuse me, in the synagogue. And um, he would have been working with the Pharisees probably. Uh, but, uh, you know, those folks weren't terribly fond of Jesus. So it's, it's kind of interesting that he would come to Jesus, not only come to him, um, but it's, it says he bowed down before him. Um, and then we've got this woman who <laughs> I laugh every time I hear that part where Jesus says, uh, who touched me? It's kind of like going to the state fair and, and uh, <laughs> walking through the crowds and saying, somebody just touched me. I can't imagine Sarah going, really? <laughs> somebody touched you in, the, in this crowd at the fair. You want to know which one it was, huh? Um, you're a little nuts, but uh, I just think that's kind of interesting. Uh, I forget how how he read that uh, coming out of the King James, but uh, my Bible says uh, somebody deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. Um, healing power go out from me involuntarily. You know, the King James said virtue has gone out of me. Virtue has gone out of me. Um, so why do you think this is included in our scripture in, in what um, Luke wants us to read? Well, I think it showed the woman's faith that she had such faith that if she could just touch his garment, she would be healed. Okay. What about the what about Jairus? Well, I really think that he had heard Jesus's reputation, and he knew that his high priest was not going to heal his daughter. So he was just desperate, a parent just desperate for someone who could heal his daughter. Yeah, he'd heard about Jesus. A lot of people think this uh, synagogue they're talking about is in Capernaum, which, of course, would have been Jesus's kind of headquarters. So he definitely would have heard. He would have heard Jesus uh, teach and preach. He would have seen him heal by now. Um, and so, yeah, he had probably developed a faith on which he acted. And um, I think that's one of the to me, that's one of the things that that we're supposed to learn from this is is we can't just have faith we have to have faith that leads us to action um well i thought um ross that um you know crowds have gathered around jesus throughout our study here but this is the first one that really you know touched him right or came forth i mean she i think like david said was really following her faith or i mean yeah. would you go in through a, a crowd i wonder if you know put ourselves in that position and and they use that key word he, that the crowd was he was almost crushed i mean that was pretty explicit there so i just visualized this lady just i don't know propelled toward him with you know deep faith jesus didn't know her did he he didn't know her he, he didn't seem to no, but maybe she wanted to, to show that he, I mean, touching his cloak wouldn't be like a, we talked about the mysteries and the magicalness of him, but I think, you know, her faith kind of healed herself. I don't know. I thought yeah. it was pretty, pretty good. Yeah, I, I wrote a question down here of why, why didn't he just let her, you know, why didn't he just let her slip off? You know, with Jesus, Jesus tends to have insights about people. I think that that God part of him kicks in uh, and he he knows 
people's intentions and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and if, if he thought she was trying to just slip in there unnoticed because with the flow of blood that she had, she was probably socially outcast. Um, and people around there, I'm, I'm thinking would have known her uh, if she was from the area. We really don't know if she was from that area or whether she was from somewhere else and had traveled and, and uh, knew he was going to be there. But why do you think she, he didn't just kind of let her slip off? feel the power go out of him, know that something had happened. Why did he kind of call her out? Well, did he want to identify her as a woman of faith? I mean. You think? He, he wanted to command her for her faith. Right. That could be. And, and show that to others, the witnesses. Okay. Anybody else have any ideas? We're speculating well, here. So told her to go in peace. So I think he wanted to sort of reassure her and you know acknowledge acknowledge her, just let her know that you know she should go in peace and everything was okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only thing I could come up with was maybe he wanted her to know that, that she was noticed and that she was cared for. And maybe he wanted the crowd to hear that she was noticed and cared for. And um, that she was, and that she was not acceptable to them as being quiet. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting uh, couple of passage, a uh, couple of scenarios here. Um, and of course he goes to the house and, and raises the girl which is not the last time we see him raise somebody from the dead. Um, but, uh, you know, that is, we're seeing powers here that we'll see in, in uh, a few minutes that uh, he confers upon the apostles as he sends them out. Um, Paul, the apostle Paul, supposedly had the, the power to heal and to uh, raise people from the dead. Um, he didn't use it a lot, but um, he said he had it. But uh, anyway, uh, Ross, Ross, yes, sir. Uh, while we're still there, uh, yes, I, it's really interesting to me in the difference in the translation uh, concerning. I think I think the Jim, the King James version talked about the border. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the lady touched him on the border. The uh, New Revised Standard Version says fringe. Yeah, that's what mine and says. That, and that says that that he he wore a very elaborate high Jew stole or whatever you want to call it. And because this had fringes on it, it had the phylactery at the bottom corner. Uh, I mean, it normally would. I, it doesn't say that. You're talking about like the prayer shawl that they wore? Yeah. It had the fringes uh -huh. that hung off? Yes. Yeah. 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 So that, that tells a little bit about Jesus too, I think. Yeah. Very devout. Um, very close to God. Um, and and uh, most priestly. Um, maybe that's not quite the word for it, but, it, but it's big time Jews wore those things. Right. Yep. All right. Well, this, this carries us into uh, chapter nine. Uh, again, all these chapters are rather arbitrary where they start and stop. It's just one continuous story. Um, Jesus sends out the 12 apostles. Um, let's kind of read that together with Herod's little the little part about Herod so if there's somebody who wants to start with 9-1 and go through 9-9 that would be helpful to us oh well okay thank you <clears throat> the, then Jesus called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal 
He said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. Who, who, uh, wherever they do not welcome you, as you are leaving that town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They departed and went through the villages, bringing the good news and curing diseases everywhere. Now Herod the ruler heard all about, uh, heard all that had taken place, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the ancient prophets had arisen. Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he tried to see him. Mm, he tried to see him. Um, this, this part is in uh, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, it doesn't appear in John. Uh, gives the the ones that he's sending out the 12 that he's sending out the same powers that he has to to heal um and to raise the dead uh and to preach uh to teach whatever to make the announcements uh, now notice who he's sending out uh they have not been through bible college they haven't been through seminary they don't have any degrees um you know it's it's just the same guys that have been traveling around with him. Um, you know, we, I think some people think to be, uh, uh, to teach a Bible study or a Sunday school class or to share uh, the, the gospel with friends that they've got to have this training. Uh, but that's not true. Uh, God calls all of us to participate in, um, in spreading the good news and, and trying to, to teach other people and share with them. Um, I love it when, when people come to me and say, Hey, I'm feeling called to, to teach a Bible study. Can I do that? <laughs> yeah, of course you can. <laughs> yes, please. Um, do it, do it. Um, and he sends them out not to be miracle workers but to talk about the kingdom of God that was being inaugurated. Um, so what is the nature of this kingdom of God that they're supposed to go out? As, as you've watched Jesus and listened to him so far, uh, what, were, what are some things that you think characterize the kingdom of God over and against an earthly kingdom. They were telling about Jesus Christ, about him being the word, the son of God. Okay. Caring for others, looking out for the, the poor and the downtrodden. Okay, so it's, it's maybe less about power and more about caring for other people. Yeah, I was mm -hmm. thinking about Jesus, Jesus's compassion toward others that would make it more godly than, than worldly. Right. So he's talking about a, a spiritual kingdom. Yeah that I was going to say that it's not an earthly kingdom, but it is, it is a spiritual kingdom, but it does take up space and time. Right. It's not just otherworldly. Um, it's meant to be manifested here, not just in heaven. What else comes to mind? Anything? 
I mean, we're talking about a people who were really probably thinking about a Messiah that was going to come and oust the Romans and restore the former glory of their kingdom. Like, you know, when David and Solomon were kings, um, but that wasn't what Jesus was here to do. He, teamed, he seemed to take care of people, be concerned about people both physically and spiritually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you think both? Uh, it's, it's hard to take care of someone spiritually if they're starving to death. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, that kind of takes us into that next uh, story that with the feeding of the 5,000. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, what about this business of shaking the dust off their feet? That's what I didn't understand. Yeah. What's the purpose of that? It kind of reminds you of that saying, shake it off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of go on and forget all about it. Yeah. Move, move on. Yeah. Don't let it bog you down. I'll bog it down, and uh, it, it actually uh, leaves a, a bit of a, a visual for the people that you're leaving, um, you know? Um, I don't know. It's, uh, it goes back to the parable of the sower with the seed. Uh, some seed falls on soil that's not, not fertile, just not going to produce anything, so need to look for fertile, fertile soil. Yeah. Yeah. There's one, one point maybe that needs to be emphasized, maybe, and correct me, uh, when they went out and, and bringing the good news and curing the disease, they don't, they don't say anything about Jesus. You know, they, because they don't know how Jesus fits into the kingdom yet. They just talk about kingdom and what you have to do to be prepared. Right. Yep. He just, my, my Bible says he sent them out to tell everyone about the coming of the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So yep. that doesn't necessarily mean that they use the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like we said right. last week, they're still yeah. trying to figure out who Jesus is. Right. Right. And that's uh, that seems to be what's going on with Herod a little bit. He's not quite sure who Jesus is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what? He's afraid of him. Herod's afraid of Jesus. Popularity. Uh, afraid of Jesus' popularity, not of Jesus. Right, his popularity. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that he says, and he tried to see him. The uh, the other uh, the other gospels don't mention anything about him trying to see Jesus. They they have pretty much the other parts of this, um, saying you know, thinking he's maybe John come back to life somehow. Um, but I think it's interesting that this one says, and he tried to see him. If he tried, he would have seen him, I think. I, I, I think he could have made it happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's like saying the, the president of the United States tried to see somebody but couldn't make it happen. I'm pretty sure you can make it happen if you want to. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's move on to this uh, feeding of the 5,000. Who wants to read that? That's uh, verses 10 through 17. I will. All right. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Beth Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the 12 came to him and said, 
Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. He replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. About 5,000 men were there. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so and everybody sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Wow. Mm. So, so let's start out by understanding how many people we had. What does it say? 5,000. 5,000 5, men. men. Right. <laughs> 5,000 men. about that yesterday. Yeah. So it doesn't count the women. It doesn't count any children that the women dragged along with them because they couldn't leave them home without tearing up the house. Um, so let's just say for sake of argument that um, there were at least as many, many uh, women and children as there were men. So could be, could be 10,000 people there. 10,000 people. Let that settle in a second. 10,000 people. That's a lot of people. And I could understand, I think I would have been one of the disciples saying, uh, it's good to be supper time. Uh, how about we send these people out and let them find a McDonald's? And um, if you want them to come back, that's fine. <laughs> but to have your leader turn around and say, well, you feed them. <laughs> you feed them. And then you turn around. Can you imagine somebody saying that to you? And you look out and you look at these people and go, uh, <laughs> really? Uh, this, this story appears in all four gospels. Um, in, um, oh, which one? Let's see. Uh, the gospel of John, uh, he talks to Philip and he says, Hey, where Philip, where can we get some where can we get some food? Um, and uh, so Philip was from Bethsaida. And that's that's why I would think that um, he doesn't really say in John that they're at Bethsaida, but um, he thinks Philip would know where the good restaurants are, where the good markets are. Um, but they end up with what? Uh, five loaves and two fish. Now, I don't know how big these loaves were, but they were small enough to travel with, <laughs> right? We're not talking about French baguettes, you know, two feet long, probably. Um, we're talking about something people take, you know, you, you pack a sandwich, you pack a picnic. Um, somebody's packed some bread and somebody else has, has got some fish that they've caught, two of them, two of them. Now, I've been over there and, and eaten some of the restaurants around the Sea of Galilee. Now, we're talking about Bethsaida, which is around the top side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, they have uh, what, what they call Peter's fish over there, uh, which is really just tilapia. Um, but, I mean, you've got one on your plate, and it's about that long with the head still on it. Yes. So, you know, not terribly big. We're not talking about them. Uh, hauling in a tuna or two uh, and cutting it up. We're talking about like pond fish, lake fish that you're pulling in. Uh, is this really just about a miracle of multiplication? What, what do you think this is really about? Why is this even in here? Was it supposed to show that God won't give us more than we can handle. Maybe. I hadn't thought, I hadn't thought about that. That's, that's, uh, I don't know. Perhaps 
that's yeah. actually that's actually um, a wonderful idea that we have. Um, and and I don't mean to I'm not trying to step on you here, um, but that's not a biblical principle. Um, it's, it's, it, <laughs> and and I'm, I'm, I want to say it as gently as I can, because <laughs> I have I have said that in my life. And I finally was, uh, I was doing a sermon one time and it was on something kind of like that. And I, and I got into really studying that and found that's not actually in the Bible. (laughs) (laughs) And I was, what actually is in the Bible is that God does give us, Paul talks about traveling on one of his travels, um, all of the things that they ran up against, all the storms and the shipwrecks and the, and the uh, being arrested. And he very specifically says, God does give you more than you can handle. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, uh, but it's uh, uh, meant to turn us toward God. So, um, what um, we, we what we kind of do is we conflate this this idea. Uh, he does tell us that we will not be tempted more than we're able to resist. But there's a caveat after that with his help. So he doesn't mean for us to be tempted more than we can resist. Tempted to sin more than we can resist uh, without his help. Uh, but he will allow us to experience things in life that are beyond our ability to bear. Um, he doesn't. He doesn't keep us from experiencing hard times. Um, and of course, I, I think that's probably meant to help us to turn toward him. Um, that's that's just one of those things we throw out there. We've probably thrown it out our whole lives, kind of like the whole thing of uh, God helps those who help themselves. That's not the Bible either. Shakespeare. Right? <laughs> Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I look at this and um, I think, uh, and this is not the only way to look at this. I think this is maybe about having a God-sized problem, um, which is kind of like having more than we can handle. Um, which might be where you were headed. Uh, Sometimes we have to have a challenge in front of us that is bigger than we can handle so that we can see how God is going to work it out and that we know that we didn't do it. Uh, I know I've I've said this in a sermon, I believe, uh, at my last church. First year I was there, uh, the... Uh, the finance committee, there was a time of the year where they were getting the budget together for the next year. And we had a guy who was the chair of the finance committee, wonderful guy. Uh, He was very much of a numbers person. And uh, he had gone back and he had looked at the previous, I think, five years and said, well, here's, here's what the giving has been over the past five years. And so looking at that percentage increase, I think that we can uh, only sustain about a 1% increase in the budget. Well, we had sent out budget requests uh, forms to the different ministry areas. And what they'd come back with was a 2.5% amounted to a 2.5% increase in the budget for the next year. And of course, after laying those two things out uh he turns to the new guy (laughs) and says okay preacher um what do you say i went oh in my mind i went oh great (laughs) um i said well here's here's what i say i'm supposed to be the spiritual leader here so if what you're telling me is that uh on our own without god's help at all we can meet a 1% increase and that to meet a two and a half percent increase, we need God. It's a no brainer. Um, We have to do two and a half percent because we need the congregation to know that it took God to make it happen. 
Um, we don't need to be doing anything around this church that doesn't take God to do it. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of how I look at this is um, maybe Jesus was saying, okay, yeah, on our own, we can send these people out and on their own, they can probably find some place to eat uh, something. But is that really what we're trying for here? Are we trying to inaugurate a kingdom that doesn't need God as its head or the other thing? <laughs> um, are we trying to do something where we want everybody to see the power and the nature of God and that God isn't just a God of, of justice and judgment, but God is also a God who cares about our spirit and cares about our well-being and um you know ended up feeding as as david said you, you, you can't um you can't very well take care of somebody's spirit if they're sitting there and their stomach's grumbling and that's all they can think about mm -hmm. so god cared about their their bodies their well-being the, their whole well-being but well, it took yes sir well, Parallel to, to this thinking, uh, a number of years back, I got turned off by that uh, God-sized problem. Uh -huh. But I agree with what, you know, with what you're talking about. But, you know, the book of Jonah and uh, in the Old Testament where they were talking about building the temple, there's no detail too small, no problem too small to take the God. And I, to yep. me, you know, our relationship with God should be such that we take the little stuff, because if we take the little stuff, at least in our own personal lives, we won't have the big things, uh, at least from the things we do within. We'll be confronted. That's not what I'm saying, but we'll be confronted by, but in our growth, we need to understand that God cares about the little stuff, too. I absolutely if, agree with that. If, if you look at uh, the book of Jonah, you know, all of this stuff that, that God tells him that, where were you when this happened and this happened and this happened? And, you know, and I know about whatever. And, but it just shows that, the, the, at, at least in the, the author's mind, what kind of detail God's involved in. Yeah. God knows the, the number of hairs on our head. Yeah. Um, he knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. Yeah, I, you know, I, I listen to what you're saying, and I agree wholeheartedly with it. And I think for me, it has to do with habit. Um, that if we don't get in the habit of taking everything to God, starting with the small things, that when it gets to the big things, either we're going to be tempted to do them ourselves somehow, or we're just going to be discouraged. Um, and and that's why I came up with that, that uh, term, hip pocket Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have it in your hip pocket until something really bad happens and then you bring it out. Right. <laughs> when it shouldn't be. Yeah. It, it shouldn't be um, the, uh, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, I can't think right now. Sorry, shouldn't be our second second choice. Yeah. You know, our reserve choice. Uh, if we if we take the small things, we get used to doing that. Yeah, this is always an interesting story to me because there's so many parts of it. Uh, well, let's uh, let's move on to <laughs> Jesus. Uh, predicting his death and Peter saying who he thinks Jesus is. So for somebody who wants to read 18 through 27. All right. <clears throat> Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who did the crowd say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. And still others, 
that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And he must be killed on, and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my word, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Thank you, sir. So who do people say that I am? Uh, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others uh, some of the old prophets. People are still asking that question today. Mm -hmm. Who who have you heard people speculating of who Jesus is? Son of God. Okay, Son of God. Well, I think to the non-believers, he was just a good man who had a good philosophy. Okay. Some people say he was just a, a nice man who was a good teacher. Yeah. Have you heard anything else these days or during your lifetime? It was a fake, fictional character. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard that one too. Yeah. Just a kind of a mythological character. Mm -hmm. Yes. Made up to make us feel good. Give us a good example. Yeah. Um, there's, there is still debate. It's still going on. Uh, it's, it is not settled um, amongst the people of the world. Now, um, in the three synoptics, uh, Peter, and again, the synoptics are the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, John tends to be kind of off on his own a lot of the time. Uh, there are a few things that happened in all four, but um, Matthew and Luke, a lot of times agree with Mark uh, a lot of times because they use Mark as a source. But um, in Matthew uh, or, or in, in the synoptics, Peter uh, claims Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, however you want to translate that word. But it's only in Matthew where Jesus says back to him that uh only you only know this because of my father in heaven has revealed it to you. Um, now <laughs> he doesn't say, and so we don't know. Uh, we can think what we want to think about whether or not he, the father revealed it to anybody else in the group um, or did not reveal that to anybody else in the group. Uh, maybe, maybe the father revealed it to all the disciples and Peter was the only one bold enough to say it. Uh, you know, Peter was kind of famous for that. You know, he would just blurt stuff out um, without thinking about it. But um, I think you can make an argument for either. Um, you know, from the, the, the side where he told everybody and Peter just was the one that was bold enough to say it. 
Uh, I think sometimes, you know, there's a lesson in that if we wanted to take that and kind of run with it, speculating uh, that we, we need to be bold and uh, we need to say who we believe Jesus to be. Uh, on the flip side, if, if we want to make the argument that maybe the father didn't reveal it to everybody, you could make the, the kind of logical jump that God doesn't give us knowledge until he feels like we're ready to receive it. Um, and I think there's a little bit of truth in each one of those. But um, Jesus goes on here beyond this declaration to begin to talk about his death. Uh, he begins to turn his sights toward Jerusalem. And um, so what is, what is he revealing to them now about who he is versus who some people would like him to be? I'm thinking I'm, I'm not gonna be that great military leader that I'm gonna be sacrificed. Okay. What? Or I'm not the miracle yeah. worker that you've seen me be. Not, not another ten minutes. Okay. I'll be there in just a minute. Yeah, uh, I'm not just here to be a miracle worker. Bye. What else? Well, he goes on to in verse, I can't see what, what verse it is, 20, well, 26, whoever's ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes to his glory. Yeah. How do you like that? Wow. What does that mean? It means we have to proclaim him that we can't hide it under a rock as they right. say it goes. Yeah. Yeah. If uh, if you're worried about what people are going to think of you because you're associated with me in the in the kingdom of God, uh, do you really have faith? Are you really in? You know, this whole thing of a divided house can't stand, or you can't be on the you can't be on the fence. Um, you can't believe and not act. You know, we find that in James as well. Um, well, isn't he kind of commanding his disciples to commit to him? Isn't he being the bold one here? Like you said, I mean, like you said, he wants them to take a stand. Yeah, but look who he's talking to. What does it say in verse 23? He's He, there, he makes a shift in the right. first part of that. To the second part of that to them all all right so he's not just calling the 12 to task here he's he's been talking to the 12 and you know who, okay so who do people say that i am and then you know there's people around them who are overhearing this conversation as he talks to his inner circle but then he turns and to the whole crowd he says okay this is what it means. This is who I'm going to be. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be somebody who is, um, you know, you just heard me say that I'm going to be someone who's going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to rise from the dead. Now, if you want to be my followers and not just a bunch of hangers on, uh, walking around thinking, uh, well, it's been interesting watching him heal. Let's keep following this sideshow kind of thing. If you really want to follow me, uh, then you got this whole thing of taking up your cross yeah. daily. Um, and uh, you got to give up your life. Um, what does is, what is all that mean? We, we throw out these phrases in the church, you know, like they're candy. You know, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Um, you know, I've had people, I've even used it jokingly. You know, some people say, well, you know, I'm a Carolina fan. So, well, everybody's got their cross to bear. But, yeah. you know. Uh, 
Oh. But uh, what what does it mean to to take up your cross? To... You know, every time I hear the phrase, um, "Who do you say that I am?" It reminds me that all of us have to ask that question. You know, who who do we say Jesus is? It's it's not just about what we read. It's not just about what we learn, but it's about what we believe. What what you know? It's, it's like going from head to heart. Okay. You know, that that if we have to we ask the question, you know, in our hearts, what, who who do we really say Jesus is? You know, we 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 have all these phrases and and everything that the Bible says that, but you know, it doesn't do us. I don't think it does us much good if we just we don't believe it in our hearts. Yeah. Oh. Let's take that a, a, a step further. What is what is the difference between intellectual assent and believing something in your heart, having faith in it? Well, I think to learn it, it's, it's like learning something, but in our hearts, we put it into practice. We, okay. we you know, we learn something and and it's, it's great knowledge, but to, to have it in our hearts is that we, we believe it and then we put it into practice. We do what he says. Okay. And, and it's, it's an acceptance, internal acceptance of a relationship. Right. With God. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so take this, take this that you're saying and talk about the taking up the cross. What does that mean? Does it mean going to a physical cross? It's sacrifice. Okay. And Please. it reminds me of the first school shooting in Columbine. Um, this girl was facing the, um, mm -hmm. the murderer. He asked her if she believed in God, and she said she did. And so he shot her, but she was brave enough to say she did. Okay. And it's from what what I have seen, it's kind of a step beyond normal responsibilities. If you take care of your parents, then that's a normal responsibility. That in itself is not a cross. It's when you reach out or do the unexpected or of what we aren't expected to do, uh, whatever. Uh, it's, it's, it's a step beyond where we are. Okay. It's reaching out to other people, I guess. Okay. And it may put you in uncomfortable places. Yeah. Or, uh, right. Yeah. Uncharted waters. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have Bibles that have glosses at the bottom uh the editor's comments at the bottom what does it say does it say anything about the whole taking up your cross thing talks about self-denial complete dedication and willing obedience say that again uh self-denial complete dedication and willing obedience. Okay, self denial, willing obedience. Yeah. I've got to sign out, folks. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Bye. Bye. See you later. Julian. See you later. Bye. John, Bye. I know Bye. you got to okay. you got to head out too, John. Right. Bye, John. We'll see y'all next week. Bye. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, look at Jesus going going to his cross um now his was a, a physical cross but um uh, he had to embrace humility mm -hmm. um be willing to lose his life um i think it has to do with uh you know people love to have jesus as their savior but we're supposed to have him as our Lord and Savior. Uh, we don't really like the Lord part. We want to direct our own lives. 
Oh. Uh, we don't uh, we don't like somebody else being our Lord. Um, but it does take a, a willingness to put your own will aside, um, humble yourself, uh, and all the stuff that that John mentioned there as well. Um, sacrificial. Uh, I think uh, maybe one of y'all, David, I think said the word sacrificial. That's one of the things that comes to mind to me when we talk about taking up cross. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing to take up your cross. What is it that challenges you? What is it that, that uh, you would most like to put off and not embrace, but you, you know that to exercise your faith, you've got to confront it. You've got to engage it um, in such a way that your faith is built, that other people's faith can be built up and that God receives the glory for it. Because everything is about God receiving the glory, right? And the praise and the honor. All right. Well, next time we're going to pick up with the transfiguration. That weird, weird thing that happens. <laughs> I think, at least I think it's weird. Uh, so we'll start there next week. Uh, anything you want to lift in prayer this week? Positive or, or, uh, uh, concerns, praises or concerns. Well, positive, I'm supposed to get my first shot Friday. <laughs> and you did? This coming Friday. Oh, this coming Friday. Yeah, I'm scheduled for it. All right. Yeah, praises for everybody who's getting vaccines. Hallelujah. That's right. I saw something on Facebook the other day about it was aimed at the people who are who are not wanting the vaccine, uh, you probably saw this. He said, you, to all you people who uh, don't want to take the vaccine because you don't know what's in it, right. you've been eating hot dogs and chicken nuggets your whole life. <laughs> and you don't know what's in those either. <laughs> right. Go get the vaccine. <laughs> I have some of my relatives that are really conservative that they'll send me all these things that are negative on the vaccines. Why oh, really? And I always respond, well, I'm going to take it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought that one was funny. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to pray about? It's not to pray, but I have a question about next Wednesday mm -hmm. about the the drive through. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now is do we stay in our cars? Yep. Okay, that's what I need to know. Yep. Yep. We're we're just gonna ask people to keep their mask on, stay in their car. We'll lean in through the window, have a little prayer put the ashes on and give you some stuff and, and you can head out. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Trying to make it as uh, acceptable to everybody as possible. Thank safe you. and safe. Thank you. All right. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. I thank you for uh, each person who has participated today and for the ways that you speak through uh, your people to uh, educate us all. And uh, thank you for your Holy Spirit that enlivens our hearts and our faith. And uh, as we continue to confront this pandemic, we're grateful for the vaccines for, that uh, you have given people the knowledge to be able to create these things. And we ask that you would continue to give people the boldness and the um, the courage to, to receive this vaccine, even though they uh, don't have any experience with it. May they trust that it is from you. Uh, and we give you praise for all the healing that it will uh, accomplish and all of the diseases that will be averted because of it, uh, the cases that will be averted because of it. And we continue to lift up the families who lose loved ones yes. and who have people who are mm -hmm. sick that they're caring for. And we give you thanks for the healings that take place and for the ways that people support those who are grieving, even during this time where they're maybe not able to 
physically be around them and, and physically hug them, but uh, they can they can offer gestures of support and words of of hope. The Lord be with us as we go through the rest of our week until we come together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes. It's good to see all your faces today. Good to see Thank you, you Ross. Thank you, Ross. Y'all have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Thank you. Yeah. See you later. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.